God could have chosen anywhere on earth, but he chose Israel. He could have revealed his redemption anywhere. He chose Jerusalem. The house of the Lord might have been any place on earth. He chose Mount Moriah. Past, present, and future, the mountain of the Lord has been a beacon of hope and remains a strategic site for the next temple of God. Dateline Jerusalem, the coming temple. We are so glad you've joined us today. We are in our series, Dateline Jerusalem. Yes. We have the two gorgeous brothers, sorry babe, hey, these Jewish guys that are sitting in these important seats today. <laughs> We're thankful that you're here on set teaching us. Wow, very grateful. grateful to be here. Yeah, I, yeah, we travel as a ministry to Israel a mm -hmm. lot, two times a year on tours. I love traveling, but there's something about coming home and having a place to land. Yes. And that's what we're talking about today, that, right? That With is, the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. but you see, you can take that for granted because not everybody has always had that. And the Jewish people for 2,000 years were scattered and didn't have a place to call home. That's true. And then all of a sudden, here it happens. In Isaiah 66, 8, it was prophesied, can a nation be born in a day? And the answer is yes, on May 14, 1948, prophecy fulfilled for this generation's own eyes. That's a miracle. We go now to Dr. Seif's teaching in one of my favorite places, the Eastern Gate in Jerusalem. Let's go there now. I love the Kidron Valley and I love the fact that I'm coming to you from it. You can see the Eastern Jerusalem wall behind me and this beautiful picture of terraced gardens. Of course, you hear some noise too because the Kidron Valley is right up against a major a thoroughfare here and tourists are just coming all around this city wanting to get a piece of the miracle that is Israel. I can't control the noise. I can't control the voice that comes from all of that. But I want to look at the voice from this, the Bible itself, and underscore with you how and why it is that this land is so very special. What it is that makes it that. Well, I'm looking at Ezekiel 37 here, and we're looking at prophetic literature. And the author says in verse 5, he says, and you will dwell in the land that I've given to Jacob, my servant, Asher Yeshvu Bo Avotechem, the land where your fathers dwelt. You've heard of Israel referred to as the promised land. And here Ezekiel is speaking to refugees and he gives voice to the fact that, that they're going to come back to this land. And, and by the way, we're living in the coming back to the land moment. I mean, it really is one of those stories where you find something in the biblical word and in the modern newspaper and you can, you can look at those two in tandem. Uh, the, the prophet predicted a return and we're living in the return, which is why I'm coming to you here from the Kidron Valley. Now, God's going to do something special here. And it says, or he says rather, as, as I go on through 25, that this is a land that was uh, bequeathed to not only Jacob, but his children and his children's children. And he says, Ad olam, that is for, throughout all generations or forever. Now, a Bible reader knows that God... Uh, gave a people real estate. Uh, people wonder why the Jews read the, the Bible and they can't see Jesus. I wonder why Christians read the Bible and can't see Jews, because it seems so rather clear in the literature that God gave a people a land. What is it that makes the place so special? And it's not the fact that, that, that Hebrew people live in it and our Arab cousins and others. What makes it special isn't the human inhabitants of it, though it's given to certain people. What makes it special according to the text? And I want to pick up here in verse 26. The Lord says, Vinotati et mik doshi bitokam leolam, and I will set my sanctuary in it. What makes the place is the fact that God makes this his place. It was like that since the dawn of creation, actually, uh, in Gan Eden. And we explored this earlier in Eden. Uh, God dwelt with you, mankind. If one asks the question, where uh, was Eden? Well, Eden in antiquity 
is Israel in biblical literature and modern Israel is in effect the, 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 the real estate where God dwelt with his people and the sanctuary uh, was to be built here that he might dwell with them again. Now, when you look at biblical prophecy, and this program deals with it. When we look at Dateline Jerusalem, we're interested in the story to be sure of what's happening here in this land. But there's an undercurrent. It's not simply displaced persons returning to an ancestral homeland, though it is that. But in conjunction with that, uh, religious sensibilities are brought to bear. Not with all Israelis, many tend to be very, very secular, but amongst the religious uh, who are more tethered to, to biblical ways of thinking and being. Uh, because uh, religious Jews understand themselves to be people of the book. There's an inextricable relationship between the people and the Bible. And with that uh, attention to the Bible, there's an inextricable relationship between the Hebrew people and the land. Now, with the return to the land, uh, Bible readers are queuing into the fact that God is going to rebuild his sanctuary here in the land. And it's part of that forever future package. That is, it, it, it's for future days to come. It's for the world to come. He says again, just in verse 26, and I will set my sanctuary in the midst. And it's all part of uh, religious Jewish anticipation of a rebuilding of a temple. Once upon a time, it existed behind me, and in time, they believe it's going to be built and dedicated again. The International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem, has sensed a growing interest in Zion's importance in the end times. They host an annual event during Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, attended by more than 2,000 Christians from 70 countries. We asked David Parsons, Vice President of the Embassy, what he believed the most important sign was concerning the end of the age. With the, the return of the Jewish people to their ancient homeland is clearly the most unmistakable sign to our generation that uh, we're nearing the, the end of the age. All the prophets talk about it. All of them agree that there's a process going on. We don't know exactly how long this will take to to play out, but uh, um, it, it's, it's a sign that just as the, um, uh, the building of the ark was a sign to the ancient world that the, uh, you're about to be judged. When Noah built the ark in, in hum humility and obedience before God, he condemned the rest of the world to his righteous judgment. And the most unmistakable sign to us that we're nearing the end of the age and God's judgment of, of the nations is the building up of Zion. This is uh, Psalm, the book of Psalms, that when the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. This time to judge the nations, to rule in righteousness and peace on the throne of David from Jerusalem over all the nations. So, you know, the Temple Mount uh, is basically that, that throne of the Lord uh, for what we call uh, the millennium or, or the messianic age. Yehuda Glick is a former Knesset member and an outspoken advocate for the rights of all nations to worship upon the Temple Mount. Psalm 125, 132, God calls upon Zion. God wants us to choose Zion. That's the meeting place. He's inviting us to a date. Come to a date with me, God says. Hashem says, come to a date with me. Where? In my holy dwelling place, Zion, house of prayer for all nations. Not all nations called to convert to Judaism. All nations to remain who they are. You're Indonesian, or you're American, or you're Dutch, or you're Moroccan, or you're Tunisian, or you're Chinese, but there's one Hashem. We're all part of one harmony. We're diverse. Some of us are violins, and some of us are drums, and some of us are trumpets, and some of us are saxophones, and some of us are cellos, and some of us are pianos. But we're all playing in the same symphony, in the same orchestra. The orchestra that's called about, that we want to announce, 
He is one, his name is one. Kirsten and I have had the privilege of being in the office of Yehuda Glick. It really was kind of life-changing. His passion, his stories were just incredible. He, he right, he is, he's so passionate, yeah. but he also gives these beautiful word pictures. And I grew up playing the cello, and it's a, it's a big violin. So I grew up playing in symphonies, and when Yehuda just said, and he mentioned about we are all playing the same symphony, of praise to God, wow. it gave me goosebumps because I love playing my cello in the symphonies and I can't even imagine what it'll be all together to lead worship I and find sing. that amazing how he has that understanding of God's nature, of the unity that God wants in the body of Messiah, but it's so close but so far. He says, you know, he wants the temple to be a house of prayer for all nations. That's prophesied, but it won't occur until Yeshua is ruling from that temple. So the next temple that's going to be built there's no way to bring Hindus and Muslims and Buddhists and everybody together to that until Yeshua is the unifying factor. And so, yeah, Israel was reborn in a day, um, but that was a super sign. Mm -hmm. As David Parsons said, you know, previously, uh, like the ark was a sign that judgment was to come. This is a sign that something bad is coming. Yeah, there's good. God will redeem his people, but a tribulation is coming, which most people fail to recognize. If you don't mind, I'm, gonna, I'm jumping in real yeah. quick. Um, we've grown up in the church mm -hmm. and we grow up thinking, oh, that third temple is, is going to be so horrible. It's the Antichrist temple, which yeah. is what you're teaching, which is right. Yeah. But I'll tell you, listening to some of these special guests that we've, we have throughout yes. our program, there's a part of me, I'm like, oh, that third temple is going to be wonderful. So it's, it's hard. It is an answer you see to prayer what, for them. I know. It really and the is. passion, I want to jump in that. Yeah. But then I also have the, the head knowledge of what we read in the Bible. That's, it's, it's hard. And, and during the tribulation, everything will be going well for the Jewish people. First three and a half years, they're worshiping God in the temple. It's at the middle point that everything turns against them. So it's, that's what we got to remember, you know, it, it will not end up well. They need to know Yeshua now as their Savior. Love this topic. More on it in a little bit. But right now we go back to Dr. Seif's teaching in Jerusalem. I've been making television in Israel for years. And usually when you set up a, a site to shoot, you're looking for quiet. Well, good luck here. <laughs> you know, it's just not going to happen because the throngs. I mean, it was intense just getting to location. And if you're wondering what the location is, well, uh, the site behind me is a famous one. City of Jerusalem, the, the Temple Mount. Of course, there's a Islamic shrine there. Uh, in Bible days, of course, there was a Jewish temple, and we've been looking at that in the series. And by the way, there are hundreds and thousands of people around me right now looking at it. it. It was an incredible traffic jam just to get here early in the morning. And all around me, there are throngs, people coming just to experience. Well, I could say the experience of modern Israel. I think a lot of times people want to go see where Jesus walked yesterday, uh, not as interested in where he's walking today. and. Uh, uh, again, I'm not casting any aspersions on people around me. I don't like to generalize or criticize anyway, but uh, uh, beyond looking at the old bricks in Israel, there's the story of the new ones and what God is doing here in this startup nation. And that's what it's called in so many ways. So much commerce, so much industry, so much innovation, so much energy comes now from this miracle what some appropriately referred to as a miracle in the desert. The land was barren. There was nothing here, but now in so many ways it's come to life. And on so many days, so many people are making their way here to come and experience the life. And indeed, it's the trip of a lifetime. In Bible days, a prophet spoke of the day when the nations will come. Ezekiel, in so many ways, is my go-to source in this series. Uh, and here in uh, chapter uh, 37 at the very end, I want to read this to you because it's so appropriate with all of the peoples round about me. The prophet closes the chapter in verse 28 saying, And the nations will know that I am the Lord. Israel's reemergence in effect is a testimony to the world at large 
And as I've said, and as you can probably hear, there's the world at large around me right now. So many languages, even as I speak. He goes on to say, not just Vayadu Hagoyim Ki Ani Adonai, that the nations might know that I am the Lord. He says, in conjunction with Mikadesh et Yitroel, when I sanctify Israel, when I do that special work in the land, and there's a real special sanctifying, sanctifying work in the land going on right now. And then finally, Bihiyot Mikdashi Bitokam Leolam, and my sanctuary will be in their midst forever. Now there's that Hebrew word Leolam that's ubiquitous in Ezekiel, that uh, when he talks about uh, the people regathering and a temple being reconstructed, the word Leolam is attached to it over and over and over again, forever. I mention that because some will read Ezekiel and understandably say, well, you know, the prophet there was talking about people coming back from exile in Babylonia, going back to Bible times. And we've looked at that, we've unpacked that. Yeah, you know, they came back then and the prophecy's already been fulfilled. The nations observed the miracle, the reconstruction of the temple. Some then say that, 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 that the, the story of the emergence of modern Israel, uh, while it might be interesting, it's not theologically significant because God is through with the Jew. That's the perspective. And thus, some would incline to look at texts like the one that I just read, wherein the author envisions God's regathering the Hebrew people back to the land and rebuilding the temple uh, as prophecy fulfilled in yesteryear. But there's this thorny word that keeps appearing that begs us to look into the future, and that is the word leolam, or forever, that, that, that God's going to do something with the regathering of the nation state, uh, with the remanufacture of the temple complex over behind me right now, and it's going to be something that is going to go on forever. In so many ways, so many people are all around me today looking at the miracle that is indeed now and forever. I mention that because as you've heard me to say, <laughs> you don't even need to hear me to say it, you can probably pick up the ambient noise, the languages, peoples, cultures, they come here from every culture, every tribe, every language. There's a kind of magnetism here in the miracle that is Israel. And why? Because something's stirring. God is up to something. and a re-emergent temple to come as part of that thing. Here we're looking at the nation state, but there are interesting things that will emerge from it. And we'll continue to explore that as we consider more in Dateline, Jerusalem. The re-emergence of a temple has caused increased concern by the Islamic authority that presently oversees the Temple Mount. Our cameras captured the recent visit of some Jewish people whose every step was monitored very carefully by police. There's a prophetic sense in the air that has stirred an increase in hope for many Bible believers, as well as consternation by those who oppose any change of the status quo upon the Mount. Look, my master's is in history. I can tell you about what was. I can't tell you about the future. That's the most difficult thing for me to predict is the future. But I can tell you what our mission is for today. Our mission is to change the music on Temple Mount, is to make Temple Mount holy again. And the way to do it is by more people coming there and demanding, yes, call upon your, 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 your governments and tell them, guys, we want, to be, we want this uh, prohibition of allowing to carry a Bible in Temple Mount should be removed. This prohibition of being able to worship together on, 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 on Zion should be removed. We have to stand up for our human basic liberal religious rights to pray, to worship, to worship the one and only God. Where? In the place that he chose, in Zion. That's the call. Well, um, as a spokesman for the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem, I try to speak for as broad a group as I can, and especially uh, as far as our official position. We think it's good to encourage uh, temple awareness, the importance, the significance of uh, the temple in Jewish history, 
Uh, and I'd also add that we think it's important that Christians be responsible. We, we practice a responsible brand of Christian Zionism that we're not going to go agitating even if we think we know exactly how things are going to play out and we want to try and force things. It's a sensitive issue, the Temple Mount. It is the main fault line in the Israeli-Palestinian uh, debate, even moving your embassies here. You can do it without blowing up the Middle East, but you, you have a few Jews go up and pray on the Temple Mount, the whole place explodes. And we need to be sensitive to that and realize that and not put Israel in danger. Just thinking logically, the Temple Mount shouldn't be a place of turmoil and contest. I mean, you look at the Quran, Yerushalayim, the Temple Mount, the Dome of Rock, not even mentioned anywhere in that. But elementary logic states, you know, if a child has a ball and he doesn't play with it, he doesn't want it, he doesn't care for it. Another child comes, takes that ball from him, then suddenly he wants the ball. It's a spiritual force being moved by the enemy against the Arab people that causes this turmoil to want something they cannot have. God's holy mountain. Now I got an opportunity to sit down with Mark Hitchcock, a Bible prophecy expert, where he explains when this turmoil all began, it was a rebirth of the state of Israel. We're back with Mark Hitchcock. You're a pastor, you're a Bible prophecy teacher, you're an author. Um, it's very interesting, Mark. May 14, 1948, the state of Israel was reborn. And before that point, people thought, you know, that prophecy, you know, maybe an allegory sim symbolism, but it really woke up the church, that event happening. Um, so was it pro really prophetic? Some people, oh, maybe that really wasn't prophesied. It, it was an accident. That couldn't have been an accident, could it? No, there's no way. I mean, it's, it's really, it's been called the miracle on the Mediterranean. Yes. You had a, a group of people who'd been banished to 70 different countries mm. for 2,000 years, brought back to their land. Their, their language had died out. Yeah, it was I mean, a dead it's, language. It, yeah, it's a, it's a miracle. I mean, there, there's no way that that could just, you know, have happened. And, you know, and there's a lot of prophecy in Scripture that tells us that. Ezekiel 36 and 37 yes. talks about this, this regathering to their homeland of the Jewish people. And I like to call 1948 and the regathering of Israel to their land the super sign of the end times. Yeah. Because almost all the other prophecies are related in one way or another to Israel being in their land. Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, you know, it says the Antichrist, the event that starts the seven-year tribulation, the Antichrist makes a treaty with the many in Israel. Well, you can't do that if, if they're not no in Israel. Israel. Yeah. Um, you have Ezekiel 38 and 39, this Gog-Magog invasion, an invasion of the land of Israel. Well, that comes after Ezekiel 36 and 37, mm -hmm. where they've been regathered uh, back to their land. So, so many prophecies are dependent upon the Jewish people being back in their land mm -hmm. uh, in the end times. The, the whole idea of a, of a third rebuilt Jewish temple. They're not yeah. going to rebuild a temple there if they're, they're not back in their land. So that really is the super sign in many ways. And here we are now. It's been 75 years since yes. the rebirth of Israel. And you know, how much longer can this go until the rapture takes place? I don't think, you know, it doesn't seem to me like very much longer. That's right. I think we are barreling toward the end and we should stay ready because Yeshua is coming quickly. Amen. Well, thank you, Mark. Thank you so much, Mark, for your insight. Dr. Seif, that you've seen in this series, recorded this a while back and now he is traveling the world. He's a busy guy and he wanted to say hi to you from Germany. Here's Dr. Seif. Just finished ministering here at Toss and Tubing in Germany. You look around here, we there's a lot of people at the, at the altar, you know, it's a wonderful ministry center here. I was able to speak from the Torah portion of the week. And we looked at the spirit of this age, particularly with an application to how it manifests with all this perversion, sexual, relational, gender, and otherwise in culture. Great place to come here to kind of seek the Lord and get purified. Just greetings to all my friends with our Jewish roots from tubing in Germany. I was in England a few days ago, we're now Germany, and homeward bound in short order. God bless. Thank you, Jeff, for those words of encouragement. You're still going to see Jeff speaking in this series, Dateline Jerusalem. He's the teacher for this, be his last series, and afterwards Josh and I will be taking over. But he'll still show up from time to time. And if you give an offering to us today, we want to give something to you in return. This book, The End, by Mark Hitchcock, who I recently interviewed, um, along with these bookmarks, will be uh, our love gift to you. Um, words of prophecy, words of prophecy in this book, it's a lot to learn and it will encourage you in the faith. We want to encourage you also to 
financially support this ministry. You may have followed us since Zola days. If you remember watching Zola, we have had different teachers. We continue with the same heartbeat, the same mission, but we cannot continue on unless you financially help get us there. So in advance, I'd like to thank you in Hebrew, toda, toda raba, which is thank you very much for investing in this prophetic voice. Talk about prophecy, right? Yes. A lot of it today. That's right, like Mark said, Israel being reborn was a super sign of the end times. And it really was a game changer because before that, most people thought that prophecy was completely fulfilled by 70 AD or that it was an allegory. But when they saw a literal fulfillment of these prophecies, that means that the things written in Daniel and, and uh, Revelation, all that has to literally happen. And it will happen again someday soon. Now, if you've been in church at any point in time in your life, you know that there are a bunch of different views on prophecy. Yeah. And if it's grounded in the scripture, that's fine. But recently, Satan has been pushing a very dangerous concept and idea, and that is the idea that we as the body of Christ will have to live through the tribulation, endure the Father's wrath. Yeah. When we look recently with COVID, this was kind of like a, a trial run, if you will, for the church. What are you going to do when you face tribulation? What are you going to do mm -hmm. when, when everyone says, shut down your doors or you're going to get the plague? And unfortunately, we didn't fare as well as we should have in that time. Yeah. And we're seeing now more. The, the repercussions mm -hmm. of more and more people not believing in the rapture. The harpazo, the saving away of the bride so that we can go be with Messiah one day. And uh, Mark has talked about Mark Hitchcock, and we like to talk about a lot in the Bearded Bible Brothers online, but we do believe that we are spared from the wrath of the Father and that we will not endure the tribulation because he has such a better destiny for us. The marriage supper of the Lamb is waiting for us. So we should be encouraged. And it says in 1 Thessalonians 4.18, comfort one another with these words. That should be something encouraging to one of us that we will not endure that wrath. And we like to encourage all of you to continue watching this series. We have more to come next week. Yes. Yes, we do. So Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our resource this week, The End, written by Mark Hitchcock. This 500-page hardcover book is made available to you for your generous donation to Zola Levitt Ministries. The accompanying bookmark by Joshua and Caleb provides important scripture from God's word concerning the end. Please remember, we depend on your generous gifts, which allow us to bring timely updates regarding Bible prophecy and the end of days. Thank you so much for your continuous support of this ministry. Visit our website, levitt.com, for tour information, broadcast schedule, free monthly newsletter, and online store. Join us right now on our social media sites for exclusive content. Call us anytime at 1-800-WONDERS and ask about this week's resource. Please remember we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you.